Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop and Low Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. This is Emerald Planet Master Control. Go yes, calling uh, Sam in Edinburgh, Scotland. Come in, Dr. Sam. Uh, hello, this is Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. And we're actually coming to you from Edinburgh, Scotland and the United Kingdom. And we're actually having our guest come in from the beautiful and very unique country of Iceland. And so we're going to be bringing information to you concerning the, as we call, the country of fire and ice, Iceland at the top of the world, and the best practices that are happening there. And we're going to start off uh, our program with uh, information about the country of Iceland. Uh, many people do know about it, but uh, I'm not sure they know the, the total uniqueness of this uh, wonderful country and we have a gentleman that's coming in to us who is a part of the uh, geothermal energy exhibition and at the one of the largest power plants uh, in this country and Helgi welcome to the Emerald Planet thank you very much it's a pleasure to be on the show well we're glad that you're here with us and we have this uh, very interesting uh, map showing the location of Iceland and also its uh, geographical position on the planet. Tell us a little bit about the uniqueness of the location and uh, its impact actually on the world. Well, um, as, you, as you mentioned, um, I'm a part of the uh, geothermal energy exhibition here in Iceland and what really makes uh, this island um, unique uh, is the fact that it's uh, it's um, a, a part of top of the North American uh, or, or North uh, uh, North American um, uh, ocean ridge in a sense where the the, the two uh, rifts meet the plateaus meet the the, the Eurasian pl uh, uh, plateaus and and um, the North American plateau meet and uh, the the island is cracked in the middle. In a sense, and um, uh, it's a strange thing, in a sense, to be living on a top of a huge volcano, has its pluses and 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 its minuses. But uh, one of the the pluses, obvious pluses, is the uh, our access to geothermal energy, which makes this island very unique. Uh, looking at the uh, the map, and uh, I think I read that you have over 130 volcanoes. Mm -hmm. uh, in a country that's the size of the state of Virginia and the United States. Yeah. And uh, when you say you're living literally on top of a volcano, uh, that's reality for all the 320,000 citizens uh, of your beautiful country. Well, it's something that you grow up with. Uh, you know, as I said, there are pluses and there are minuses. This is something that we that we grow up with. That uh, um, uh, catastrophal uh, volcanic eruptions may may occur or may not occur. And uh, uh, but in the meantime, we are blessed with uh, an island that's. Uh, uh, you know, a, a huge island for a population this small. Uh, people tend to forget that Icelanders are, as you mentioned, only three hundred and twenty thousand. We are, um, we're a bit loud, so so that uh, that uh, kind of uh, gives the impression that we are, we are larger in numbers. But uh, we are. It's a country surrounded by, uh, you know, fishing banks. Uh, has enormous quantity of water. 
uh, that, that is in a, in a, and also turned into energy through the geothermal uh, existence. So um, what this island has uh, is uh, an enormous, uh, uh, we have enough of, of water, energy and food. Those are about the yeah. three things you need. Yes, well, I tell you, that's uh, we talk about uh, through the Emerald Planet and the power for peace of allowing communities around the globe to be self-sufficient in water, food, and energy. And actually, you're achieving that in Iceland. And also, uh, you have a tremendous amount of hydroelectricity power there as well. And what I learned through visiting your center and talking with your staff members is that your country is virtually 100% energy independent for the heating and also electricity. Is yeah. And uh, tell us the, about that as we go to this next slide, uh, a little more about Iceland and uh, its juxtaposition to uh, Europe and North America. Well, well, we are in the uh, in the middle of the North, North Atlantic Ocean, and uh, uh, as um, we usually put it, Iceland is a rock in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, surrounded by fish. There's nothing here, you know, just as Iceland is and a few horses and some sheep, and and, and uh, there's no coal, no um, no gas, uh, uh, no oil, but we have, you know, we were surrounded by all these hot springs. And we realized pretty early on that we were too few and too poor to ever be able to import coal or, or anything else for heating. So some 80 years ago, we started using the geothermal energy at our, uh, at our feet, beneath our feet. And uh, today, we heat more than 90% of all houses in Iceland with hot water from the ground our own energy source uh, and the rest with electricity that we that we produce with geothermal energy also. Um, it's ours, it's here in the ground, it's publicly owned and it's free, which is a plus. Um, uh, a flat of around 100 square meters, that's a regular size flat. In, in, in Reykjavik, our capital, you pay something like $70 a, a month, 70 bucks a month for electricity, heating, water and sewage for everything. Well, it's amazing uh, because uh, to convert that into uh, the the uh, the old English uh, system, uh, that's yeah. about a thousand square feet, and that's a good living area. But yeah. uh, we need to keep these slides moving here so that uh, we can move through yeah. Yeah. Uh, with this. But looking at this, uh, the next slide uh, that we have, uh, you have a number of. It's just amazing the infrastructure that you have for three hundred and twenty thousand people. Well, and again, again, yeah. society. Yeah. Well, again, the the explanation lies in this our own energy source, the money that we would be spending on on imported fuel, coal or whatever, uh, is the money that we can use for our infrastructure. Three hundred and twenty thousand souls. This is how we. This is how we do it. Um, uh, the, that's the that's the money we save, and really we, we really don't know how much money we're saving because if we were supposed to import oil at today's prices, I, I don't know. Um, we often put it in, in that way that you know the, our access to and the way we use geothermal energy here in Iceland is by far the largest part of the explanation as to why we are here, uh, and and. Uh, Given you a margin because of the geothermal and the hydro electricity yeah. that you have uh, for a very modern industrial state because uh, as you travel around the society, I was on your ring road uh, yeah. just yesterday when I was there. And yeah. it's a very modern road. It uh, works very well. Yeah. And uh, let's look at this next slide that we have. And uh, let's just show some more to our audiences, both. Uh, domestically and internationally what uh, the country looks like. Let's move to the next slide, please. But anyway, Helgi, as we're doing that, this is uh, one of the, the domes that you have. It looks like something on uh, Mars. We're <laughs> actually capturing this heat that comes out of this yeah. magma yeah. that's deep into the Earth. Yeah. It's one of the... Well, it's one of the Borehole houses, actually, you know, top of, 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 a, of a borehole or production well. Uh, we drill down to uh, 3,000 uh, um, 3, meters, uh, two miles, 
uh, down in the vicinities of, 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 of volcanoes and we tap the energy out. We have uh, already down there is, uh, you know, an enormous quantity of superheated groundwater. And, and that's the energy source that we are using. And um, this is uh, uh, sites that you can see uh, in many places in Iceland. Well, looking at the, uh, the source of this energy, I know that when I was uh, talking with some of your staff members and then I was at headquarters for the Reykjavik uh, Power uh, Company uh, the day before yesterday, and uh, they were telling me you're actually only using a very small fraction of the total amount of energy that's available to Iceland. Right. We can produce uh, something called 50 terawatts of energy here. Uh, which is a million, trillion something, far more than we will ever need. And um, just thinking that you are in, in, in Scotland, uh, there is talk of an undersea cable from Iceland to through the Faroe Islands to Scotland, uh, where we could uh, transmit or, or yeah, transmit um, um, electricity to Scotland. The technique is already there, but um, we would be wasting too much energy at today's uh, situation, but I'm sure that they will solve that in the, in the, in the very f uh, next few years um, you know, with the energy prices and everything going up. At the same time, though, that would call for us to um, build more installations uh, as you the power power plants as you as you saw in Iceland, and that would call for us to kind of move into the less uh, um, uh, unspoiled uh, wilderness in Europe. Um, which is the uh, the flip side of the of the coin? In, well, let's go to the next slide and yeah. uh, let's let's keep the slides moving. Uh, looking yeah. at where you are at the top of the Earth, uh, I was amazed at the the amount of light that we had uh, well after uh, midnight. Mm. And uh, there's just so many unique things about Iceland. And share us a little bit about uh, being in almost in total darkness for so many months, and then you come out into almost the, <laughs> continuous daylight yeah. uh, for uh, well, months, yeah. months. Uh, again th this is something that you just grow up with and and uh, uh, there is almost well there's a, a gloomy daylight uh, uh, from uh, oh, November December uh, January yeah, to the end of February we have a kind of a a kind of a gloomy, <laughs> gloomy daylight between 11 and and uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but then uh, it, it completely turns around in, in, in June, July and all. You have 24 hours of, of, of daylight. And, uh, we, all, we have, uh, you know, golf, uh, golf tournaments here in, in, in the night. The Northern, Northern Golf Tournament, which is a popular one. Uh, because you can, you can play out in the midnight sun. Well, Helgi and Dr. Sam, if I may break in, this is Control. Yeah, uh, Sam, ahead. it's time we're going to commercial or to our PSA break. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much. This is FirstGov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. <laughs> So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty called. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log no. on or email us Thank and you. get right. what you need. C, change of address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. Mm -hmm. e, uh, e, uh, emailing social security information. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Nice, well, that one. Mm -hmm. All right, that. Yeah. What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time! For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. And your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. But I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know. Not as many treats. A basic exercise plan, lots of walks and fresh air, and most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkups to help ensure the best possible quality of life. 
Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Good boy. Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly checkups that include preventive care and regular lab work. A message from the veterinary members of the American Animal Hospital Association. And now back to Dr. Sam in Edinburgh, Scotland. Yes, welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you as uh, our executive producer just shared with you in Edinburgh, Scotland. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of Emerald Planet, Emerald Planet uh, TV. And uh, we have an outstanding gentleman here with us from the Geothermal Energy uh, Education Center. Uh, and also, it's the one of the largest producers of geothermal in the country of Iceland, which is a very unique country, and they have a number of best practices, and the Emerald Planet traveled there to look at some of these best practices, and one of those, of course, is renewable energy, both from geothermal and from hydroelectricity, and so they're producing almost 100% of the needs uh, as far as the heating is concerned for the country and for electricity for the homes. So, uh, Helgi, welcome uh, to the Emerald Planet. Thank you very much. Uh, looking at this change, this major switch from the 1930s when you were using uh, mostly uh, coal and uh, almost like bunker oil, and then you started tapping into the geothermal and the hydro, tell us a little bit about that change from 1930 to uh, the present day as we move through the 21st century? We built the first central heating system uh, in, in, in 1930 in, in Reykjavik, and then um, we can see from early files that the, the guys were, were, were totally determined that they would abolish any need for us or try to abolish any need for us to, to um, have to rely on fossil fuel in the future. We could simply, we could see that we would never be able to 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 import or have have the have the funds to 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 do that. Um, being surrounded by all these hot springs, they went around the whole island looking for uh, geothermal resources, uh, either drilling or using existing um, uh, wells or, or, or hot springs, finding those and building small local central heating systems around the whole island and the and the small fishing villages and country towns and so forth, to the point where we are now. We're almost nine. We're more than ninety percent, almost ninety-five percent of all countries, of houses in. I'm sorry, all houses in Iceland are heated with geothermal energy, and I that's fantastic. That's, I want to move to the next slide, yeah. uh, Helgi, and uh, let's keep the slide going. Looking yeah, yeah. at the resource, tell us a little bit about uh, where it's coming from and just the power of what you have on Iceland from the geothermal. It's a, a, a relatively simple thing. I'm like we, we are extracting this energy from the from the the, the the depth of the of the of the earth. I'm like we always put it in that way that uh, by the time it stops raining in Iceland and the core of the earth has cooled off, then we're in big trouble. But until then, we are are fine. What we are doing in a very simple way is. Uh, using the, 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 the superheated groundwater that's already down there uh, at, at a depth of about two miles or something like that, where we drill down and we get the energy, uh, we use the, the steam, there's, a, there's enormously pressurized steam coming up and we use the steam Move to run the, the turbines. Yeah, and then, then we use and then we use the, uh, uh, the, the the geothermal liquid that comes out of the hole also, which carries the heat to heat fresh cold water for the central heating system in, in Reykjavik. So we're, we're doing the, 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 the two things at, at, at the same time, uh, generating electricity and heating cold fresh water for the central heating system. And yes, and I can't actually see the uh, the pipe that was running uh, across the the lava fields, mm -hmm. and I tell you, it's just amazing to see going from the international uh, airport all the yeah. way in Reykjavik, the capital, yeah. about forty eight kilometers, and it's yeah. just one giant uh, lava field all the way yeah. in the city, covered yeah. with that lichen. It's uh, it's very uh, unique. Uh, let's yeah, go to the next slide if we can. 
And uh, we're going to want to keep these slides moving so that our viewers, both domestically and internationally, can uh, learn more about this. Let's move to the next slide, please. Uh, uh, this was a little bit about this. This, of course, you know, keeps us, uh, you know, the main thing is the sustainability, uh, our own energy source that we are using in this in this way. We, we, as I said, heat, uh, we are self-sustained with, with all heating, all lighting, and uh, then uh, an additional feature, the, the way we use geothermal energy for, for greenhouses. We grow most of our vegetables um, uh, in, in greenhouses using heat from geothermal energy. Uh, we use uh, uh, the greenhouses also for cut off flowers and, and various other things. And uh, just to, to mention the, 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 a, a, a fact that I'm sure that people haven't, haven't heard about is the fact that the biggest a banana plantation in in northern Europe is 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 in Iceland. I think that's go. just amazing. I was talking with people in uh, Edinburgh this evening, and they were absolutely <laughs> flabbergasted when I was told them that you can grow bananas, pineapples, papaya, you know, all the tropical. <laughs> yeah, this is how we this is how we do things up there. Hmm. Well, that's it's a the it's an interesting interesting uh, society that we have here. Oh yes, it's very unique. But having this uh, this uh, ever uh, renewable energy source, let's move to the next slide, please. Yeah, looking at this, this is what I was looking at actually yesterday. Tell us what yeah. we are actually looking at. Uh, the, the, pipe, yeah, the pipe, the pipes, the pipelines that you see coming th down the hill, are, are 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 the pipelines carrying the steam or and the and the borehole or the geothermal liquid to the plant. And uh, uh, the plant is where you see the the stack of steam um, going coming out uh, out of the, out of the system. And and again, the beauty with using geothermal energy is that there is no fire, there's nothing burning here. We're just using uh, heat from the depth of the earth and and water. And what we do here is uh, we 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 separate the the steam from the the geothermal liquid. We use the steam to run the turbines, uh, generating electricity, and we use the heat to heat fresh cold water for the central heating system. Uh, then we, uh, we we liquefy the steam after we've used it for the for the um, generation of electricity. We liquefy it into, uh, into uh, and and inject all the run of water from the from the plant to the uh, area again where we where we took it from to preserve. The, the, the circulation of, 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 of hot water or circulation of energy that we, that we call it. Yeah, and yeah. what you're doing, and I, this is something that I learned uh, when I was at the headquarters, is that you're constantly recharging uh, these boreholes so that as you're taking the heat off, you're actually reinserting water, which is the, the base product that you need yeah. in order to bring this heat uh, yeah. from the core of the earth. Right. And that's keeping this balance, the equilibrium between the heat and the amount that you're able to extract and then to make sure that this really does stay sustainable. This is the, this is the, the constant concern. This is the major concern that we are not uh, depleting any wells or depleting anything, uh, that the, the, the circulation of, of energy there is, is uh, being, is, is rolling on. And as you can see on this slide here, this is the, the, the crack that I mentioned in the beginning where we have the the high temperature areas going through the, the, the whole uh, island, uh, has a crack there at the, 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 the plateaus on, on both sides are, are, are moving uh, away from each other some two centimeters uh, uh, in, in, a, in every hundred years. And uh, so it's a, a slow process, but uh, this enables us to, to use the energy source, which is there in, in, the, in the center. Well, it's amazing the number of uh, sites you have. We talked about over 130 uh, volcanoes uh, in this country about the size of Virginia and the United States. Yeah. That's a tremendous concentration of power in just one country. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. And you know, this is something that... Um, 
I don't know. We uh, we can um, we can uh, produce more uh, energy here, and and this also shows how we how uh, after the uh, in about 1943 in the, in the middle of the of the Second World War, we were laying uh, or really building uh, or developing the central heating system in the capital, and uh, then we went on and we took a giant leap in the in the first oil crisis. In the in 1970, 1973, uh, and, and really realized that we would have to invest, really invest, try to to finish up uh, and 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 do what we had intended to do, and and we did so. Uh, we we as I said, we do not import any oil or anything to heat our homes. The the, the only place that we heat with oil is the island of Grimsey which is a little bit off the uh, north of the polar circle, uh, where some 120 people live. Uh, otherwise, we heat most all, all our homes with uh, geothermal energy and and electricity, which we generate with with geothermal energy. Yeah, let's go to this next slide. Looking yeah, at this, give you an yeah, idea of the uh, the kind of the reverse of that. Yeah. And uh, the next slide, please. We're down to yeah, we're up to ninety percent there. Next slide, please. Well, looking at the uh, the use of the energy that you have, one of the things, the discussion is that uh, to take that uh, tremendous amount of uh, hydroelectricity and also what you're producing from geothermal and actually to bring in a fleet of electric cars so you're eliminating even the need for uh, diesel or uh, yeah. gasoline uh, for cars, because in Reykjavik, the capital city, almost two thirds of your population lives there, yeah. and it's a fairly small area where they could actually uh, be using electricity. Do you see that as maybe a step? Uh, I, would, I would, I would, I would rather think that we would invest or or, or use uh, electricity, electric uh, cars, uh, for for public uh, transportation. Uh, you know. Uh, the density of the population is such that you know most of us, as you said, live in in the Reykjavik area, the southwestern part of Iceland. But then, I have a friend, a very close friend, on on on, on the other side of the island, and um, if I have a, an electric car, uh, I, I'm not sure that I can uh, rely on that driving some 800 kilometers across the whole island uh, with no infrastructure to to support it. That's something that I'm sure that we will solve, but we will probably, the first thing we will do for electric transportation in, in this kind would be some public transportation. Yeah, because you do not have natural gas as being found around the globe, so having electricity for the public. Dr. Sam, this is Master Control. We are ready to go to the next PSA, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Helgi? Yeah. I'm going to be uh, bringing in now. Awesome. Hopefully, we'll have uh, 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 Bella coming on. And we're going to be talking Multiple about. Multiple sclerosis the, is a devastating uh, the food disease that changes that lives and forever. And locally, uh, food. Uh, you can just the National in MS Society the... does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm. Fashion. Flavor. It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org 
Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. Dr. Sam, uh, Master Control again. We are back, and we don't have the uh, scheduled guest. We still have okay. Helgi with you, though, sir. Okay. Uh, <coughs> is Helgi still here? Yes. Uh, Helgi, uh, uh, Jim, have you tried to get a hold of uh, Bella? We are trying at this time. Okay. Gotcha. All right, Helgi, why don't we go back? What I want to do is on the slides, if we can uh, go to slide number uh, 19. This is uh, for the staff there. And uh, I want to move down to uh, actually the photographs that we have uh, in your plant. And let's see if we can bring that up. Uh, yeah, let's go back to those uh, slides back up to what, number 25, please. Number 25. Okay, this is good. Come on back. Let's go on back. Oh, we just uh, went blank there, Helgi. Uh, looking at the, we'll let them uh, come up with that. Uh, Helgi, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, going into uh, the next slide and moving down to uh, back far, past the plants and on down to uh, the actual production, uh, looking at the uh, the food and using this in the uh, greenhouses. Tell us a little bit about that process and why does that work so well? Well, um, obviously, uh, we have we have the energy source, and, and uh, um, it's uh, again, it's it's relatively um, cheap. Um, like we, we, it doesn't cost that much, and, and um, uh, it's it's very clean, and and. Uh, um, uh, the the greenhouses in in Iceland are not affected or you know with with, with bugs or anything like that. We do not have uh, the same kind of uh, situation as in um, many other countries where the climate is is much warmer. Um, and uh, we grow you know, most of our vegetables, cucumbers, tomatoes, or salad, or whatever, in 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 these greenhouses and and uh, uh, we could do and we are we are testing many other features of uh, use for for the, the, the geothermal energy especially uh, drying food uh, for to preserve for for uh, for uh, later consumption uh, which could help out in 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 uh, many countries developing countries where there's problems with with storing food uh, this is something that we are working on. We are, of course, preaching the geothermal gospel to the to the to the rest of the world, and and uh, Icelandic engineers are are involved in in projects all around uh, all around the world where uh, geothermal energy can be found. Um, uh, the, the South Americans are taking giant leaps. Uh, so is Africa, for example, the Kenya Rift, based on many of the things that we have been going through for the past 80 years. What we have acquired also through the years now is, is a lot of material uh, knowledge, so which pipelines, gadgets, and uh, whatever to use uh, in, 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 the, um, in the process. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the power plants are, are designed by Icelandic engineers. The research, the, the geology of the whole thing, uh, not to mention the geology of the whole thing, is, is immense. And, and Iceland is a kind of a showcase. Uh, you get all kinds of examples of, of geology in, in Iceland. And uh, we're very proud to uh, be able to house the, uh, the uh, United Nations uh, geothermal training, uh, training program in, in, uh, in Reykjavik, which we have been doing since 1979, with uh, scientists or, or graduates coming uh, from uh, well, about uh, 70 countries, uh, some, some 500 people uh, studying with us and, and uh, using the opportunity to, to, uh, to research and, and work in, in Iceland. Yeah, looking at the uh, slide, if the uh, staff there can uh, bring this up, this is about the reduction in CO2 emissions uh, mm -hmm. due to the uh, geothermal and the hydro that you have. 
And the, actually, the avoidance, the elimination of releasing CO2 into the air, uh, bring that slide. Tell us a little bit about the avoidance of the emissions and how that may impact on uh, climate change. In, uh, in, uh, in the, during the, uh, the, the first oil crisis, we really put an effort in, into kind of finishing up what we had planned to do, building more uh, central heating uh, systems, uh, district heating systems uh, using geothermal energy. And uh, uh, in, in a period of some four or five years from, from 75 to 78, we uh, almost eliminated uh, uh, the CO2 emissions in, in, in Reykjavik, in the capital area, for example. We're down to zero now from space heating. Uh, there is a little bit from, from of course, the, the, the transportation, the, the, the cars, but uh, uh, the, the, the effects of oil furnaces and, and the coal burning and all that had disappeared. And it had a, had a huge uh, effort, a hu effect on our, on our on our climate, uh, and so forth. And can can of course do that around the world. Yeah, if you look at the uh, the old photographs and uh, up to the 1930s, before you yeah. start uh, switching over, uh, yeah. it was just this dark haze over the whole city. Right. Not uh, being uh, the lack of uh, the sunshine, but just from the fossil fuel. Emissions. Let's move forward right. with these slides down to where uh, Helgi was talking about the uh, emissions. I'm not sure why we're not getting these slides up, uh, but uh, going down to uh, the the reduction as far as the uh, CO2 and the avoidance. What do you see for the future, and what type of best practice are you able to share with the world as far as how to avoid? And, and to really look forward to the future of why we need to have the policy, uh, the forward thinking, and to address the avoidance of using fossil fuels of any kind. Well, uh, Sam, you can take a close look at the, the situation in California. You have a lot of geothermal resources there in Alaska, uh, Nevada, uh, many places. Uh, and then low temperature areas are, are in many, many, many places. What we have experienced through the years is the uh, that almost every year, I'm, I'm sorry, every every week, we get some kind of a formal visit of of engineers, scientists, um, politicians coming to Iceland to see with their own eyes that this can be done in this way. I'm like the, the you. We have solved the problems of of heating the the houses of of a whole of a whole nation, be it a small one, but in a, living in a huge on a huge uh, island. Uh, and and we have proven that this can be done in 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 this way, and it works. Uh, so uh, that's our con con contribution to to uh, to to in a sense the the, the world, and uh, they can uh, uh, you know learn from us, and 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 also of course uh, especially what we are, are trying to tell people that you can use low temperature areas in so many places for central heating purposes uh, that you should do uh, and, and uh, uh, you know but then um, it's always difficult to to <laughs> argue your case against the oil money and coal money and gas money and all that which is another thing well that goes to the uh, the policy and uh, and the whole essence of uh, politics yeah. which we stay out of as far as the emerald plant is concerned but looking at this concept as far as uh, the balance of cost uh, with the forward thinking uh, about the future and addressing uh, these issues, again, Helgi, the balance between the environment and economic development as we move towards 2050, which is kind of that demarcation line many scientists are saying uh, for, you know, the real, the heating of the, uh, the, the planet uh, sea level rise uh, occurring on a uh, regular basis these days, and then again, the, again, the constant use of uh, fossil fuels. How do you see that balance, and what do you think that 
uh, the policy makers, not just the politicians, but the policy makers can be thinking about uh, looking at the future. Well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's all a question of will. Uh, you know, I met the former premier of, of China uh, last fall. Uh, he, he visited with with us at the plant with with, with his his advisors and and um, he's seventy two years old. He's a, he's a very very well known geologist in in China before he went into politics and and he stayed there for a long time, you know, uh, a couple of a few hours and and was looking at these possible and, and he was discussing that the, the Chinese had uh, have have a lot of 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 geothermal energy, low, low temperature and high temperature areas. and uh, and um, now they have uh, they have uh, introduced their the program of 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 building some 400 uh, central heating systems in as many towns and and um, villages around china and uh, cities uh, based on the icelandic uh, how, how the icelanders have have, have uh, done this in in the past years so uh, we can at least contribute to this and and it takes I think President Obama has mentioned uh, geothermal energy several times in his speeches, and people are aware of the of the of the possibilities. But what it takes is is doing it, and and uh, we can at least tell people that it can be done. Well, looking at the uh, the cost across, and I'm looking at a slide here that shows uh, Reykjavik uh, compared to Copenhagen, Stockholm, Oslo, and Helsinki. Yeah. Uh, these are all cold climate uh, countries, and yet the cost for the heating, electricity, and the general use is uh, far less than these other uh, major capital cities. So it, it seems that it's a very logical, and this goes back to this cost issue, uh, logical uh, conclusion uh, that maybe more countries, like you're talking about the United States, but, you know, uh, Australia... Uh, New mm. Zealand, and there's many yeah. other countries yeah. around the globe that have this. They need yeah. to really get involved in uh, looking at the geothermal and uh, and use that as far as a major mix in their sources of energy. Yes, definitely so. And uh, as I said, we can at least tell people, and they can have a look at how we do this. We have been doing this for the past 80 years. And... and uh, 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 it plays a, a major role in our in our daily life, uh, uh, economically and environmentally, and 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 uh, not to, uh, and of course, you know, just daily finances. Well, we're going to lose you, Helgi, as we move Thank on to the next uh, segment. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Very nice. PSA at this time. We'll be right back with you, Dr. Sam. I helped turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year-round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your Social Security Statement of Your Benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much Social Security you're eligible to receive and when you'll get it. Then you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. 
Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie? Dinner. So, who has the drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org slash... To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as I come to you from Edinburgh in Scotland of the United Kingdom. And we're looking around the globe in a very unique country, the country of Iceland. And the number of best practices that they are employing there to develop a very sophisticated market-based society and at the same time protecting the environment. And not only are they protecting the environment, but they're actually enhancing the natural resources that they have. Many people know about the fisheries and the importance of uh, fishing to the Icelandic peoples uh, historically and the Icelandic society. And so we have the Director of Marketing Products and Services for what's called Promote uh, Iceland and also the Marketing Manager for a world-renowned program that's called Responsible Fisheries. So, Gundi, uh, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're glad to have you here, and thank you for uh, sharing with me and spending so much time. Uh, as you know, your Embassy of Iceland in the United States uh, is very kind to talk about the responsible fisheries. And we have the logo here. Uh, tell us a little bit about this logo and the importance and how you actually uh, developed this logo. Yes, this uh, project, Iceland uh, Responsible Fisheries, was developed uh, by the industry to promote the origin of the seafood from Iceland and the responsible fisheries. And uh, it was also the Ministry and the Directorate of Fisheries and the Marine Research Institute that uh, together signed a statement on responsible fisheries management in 2007. And uh, the um, principle of uh, sustainable use of marine resources are respected uh, very much here in Iceland. And and we like to uh, promote that uh, to the world through this program. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic. If we can go to the, uh, the next slide that we have here uh, about this, it's the whole thing about management. This is something that uh, many uh, governments, I think, uh, policymakers and uh, even private business don't think about the sea. They think it's kind of you just go out and harvest without managing it, but you have a very sophisticated uh, information-based technology system where you're managing it and you're managing it in real time. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, we have been very fortunate. Uh, the industry and uh, the government uh, bodies have been working together very well on this. So we have uh, uh, very sophisticated IT systems to register uh, all kinds of information about where the fish is uh, caught, uh, about the size of the fish and the state of the fish, fish stocks. So we collect data, uh, the, the fishermen do that, as well as the scientists. Uh, so uh, both the companies uh, have good information on uh, where there is uh, specific uh, species uh, and they can control uh, the fisheries. Of course, the regulations uh, are very strict in the way that uh, there are some specific areas that are closed, so you can't fish there. Uh, and the Coast Guard and uh, the Fisheries Directorate are also controlling uh, 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 and checking if the uh, fishermen uh, respect uh, the closings and uh, so, so we have all kinds of measures to, to make sure that uh, we respect the rules. And the quota system is uh, so good uh, in the sense that uh, uh, all the information about the quota are put online and uh, 
when a boat uh, uh, is landing, all the uh, amount of uh, fish is registered uh, less than 24 hours uh, after the landings. So you can see uh, online how much uh, have been caught at each given time and how much quota is left for that period of time. So it's very transparent. I think it's absolutely fantastic and transparency is the key to proper management of your fishery stocks. I would like to go to the next uh, slide uh, concerning this. Uh, but looking at the doing this in real time and also the the buyers around the globe uh, can uh, find out exactly what species are there so they know whether the, the contracts are actually being met and when they're actually being met. And at the same time, you know about the, the amount of restocking that needs to be done so that the fisheries are expanding and not contracting as many other maritime nations around the globe. Yeah, we, uh, we, uh, the companies have uh, been able to uh, steadily, steadily supply fresh fish and that's uh, a great demand for fresh fish sustainably sourced. Uh, so we put much emphasis on uh, being able to do that. So uh, provide healthy products uh, and uh, the increase has been in, in fresh products uh, to the demanding buyers around the world. Yeah, well, looking at the, uh, the tonnage that you have here and the amount of exports is coming out of uh, fisheries, there's many nations now that are, have less than uh, 10, maybe even 5% of the fishery uh, stocks that they had even uh, 15, 20 years ago but you're actually able to meet the contracts and you're expanding the fishing stock. So it seems like it's logical that countries would look at Iceland as a best practice so they can learn how to manage and grow their fisheries industry instead of having it almost uh, deplete to nothing. Yeah, we have been fortunate, uh, for instance, with the cod fisheries, we have been increasing the quotas uh, because of uh, uh, we have been uh, applying the precautionary approach uh, that is the principles and the code of uh, uh, code of conduct for from the FAO, uh, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, so, so this has been um, very successful, and we have had uh, people coming from other uh, countries, like uh, recently there was a group from New Zealand, just to get to know the system here in Iceland, so they can, uh, could learn a little bit from our experience in, in controlling the uh, fisheries. Well, looking at this, the statement of responsible fisheries management, uh, this is very telling because you have all the various uh, agencies within the government, the top three of course are affiliated with the central government, but also industry is very actively involved in this and much in uh, working uh, with the government agencies and uh, working with you directly and making sure that everybody is involved in this and that you have a sustainable future. So looking at the FAO, how does it get involved in why does the, the certified uh, stamp mean so much to not only Iceland, but also the consumers around the globe that's eating uh, the fish? Uh, there is a, a request for third party certification and uh, the FAO uh, uh, code of conduct and the uh, guidelines for uh, response, uh, labeling of uh, fisheries products, uh, they are the uh, basis uh, for, for the certification. And uh, the nations, the United Nations, uh, fisheries nations have come together to to uh, decide what uh, good fisheries management is all about. And these international requirements are the uh, requirements that we uh, use in the certification process. Or uh, it is a third party certification and uh, 
that is uh, uh, demanded by the by the market and the buyers around the world. Well, having that certification, I know, uh, Gundy, that it's, that it's very important uh, because there's many countries now where there's a lack of faith by the citizens to even eat the, the food that's produced within their own borders. And when people lose faith uh, in their food, they really uh, lose faith uh, even with the, uh, the levers of government. And so it looks like uh, by having this uh, third-party arms uh, length the certification process is a way for a good faith to be established or actually expanded uh, between the citizens, their government, and the sources of food within their own borders. Yes, uh, this is one, of course, one important way of, of telling uh, the consumers uh, how, how responsible we are. And uh, we think that uh, through this good cooperation uh, with all parties in Iceland, because of maybe we are, uh, because we are a small nation and people know each other and we have secured the transparency of everything. Uh, and those who have uh, bought from Iceland, they, if they, uh, care to look into how uh, our system is, uh, then they realize that they, ca they can trust us uh, for the sustainably sourcing our uh, the fish. Well, we're uh, quickly running out of time. Let's go to the next uh, couple of these slides, and uh, we're looking at the uh, the key components. Let's go to the next slide, and uh, let's just talk about the, the certification body. How do people know? that the certification uh, is really uh, doing what it says it's going to be doing and protecting the quality of the product and the health of the people that are consuming uh, the fish product. Uh, the uh, certification uh, audit team uh, puts together a very thorough report. It's more than 200 pages and that is available online where we, we uh, uh, have been uh, checked by uh, this international committee if we are fulfilling the requirements. So everyone can check uh, if this is uh, in case the fact. So they have been checking uh, both the, how we control the fisheries, uh, the economical uh, aspects, and uh, yeah, so, so the transparency is the key. Well, we're going to be uh, losing you shortly. We're getting ready to uh, out the credit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sam. Um, we'll be looking forward to seeing you back here in the studio next week. We're at. Uh, we are terminating the show and we'll look forward to seeing you live and in person.